Blessed be our God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest to pass through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he. They stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon, people, Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate, so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? 
Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing by nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews! And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters and again asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, 
He brought Jesus outside and sat him on the judges and sat on the judges bench at a place called the stone pavement or in Hebrew Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots, for to see who will get it. This was to fulfill that what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a great day, a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Amorathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, 
who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in that garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This past week, we have read the Passion of Jesus twice. On uh, Palm Sunday, we read Matthew's version, and today we read John's version. And I'd like to offer a reflection on Jesus' words according to Matthew. When he was at the end of his life on the cross, before he died, he cried out to God and said, Oh my God, oh my God, why have you abandoned me? And then a moment later, he said, Into your hands I commend my spirit, and died. When we talk about the passion of Jesus, more often than not, we focus on the physical aspects of his suffering the flogging, on the beatings, the crown of thorns, on Jesus carrying the cross and falling to the, to the ground on the, under the weight of the cross, on the crucifixion, on the terrible pain, on the long agony. And, and that's rightful because um, crucifixion is about the worst kind of execution that anyone can suffer. The Romans used it for runaway slaves to teach them a lesson, teach everybody a lesson. The point was to horrify people. But today I would like to call your attention to another aspect of Jesus' suffering. And it's the mental anguish. It's the fear. It's the anxiety that he must have gone through. Just a, a few days before, the crowd that welcomed him into Jerusalem, they cried out, Hosanna, hail to the king. And then all of a sudden the crowds disappear and started crying, and those that were left started yelling, crucify. The disciples that had been following him faithfully for uh, years suddenly were afraid and they ran away. Judas betrayed them. And even Peter, the man he had chosen to be the leader of the group, denied that he even knew him three times. And the worst part is that Jesus felt that his old father, God, had abandoned him. And that's why he cried out, oh my God, oh my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus always had a very uh, intimate relationship with God the Father. He called God Abba. Abba means Daddy. And it was an affectionate way to show that God was not the, um, the king, God was not the judge, but God was love. And he heard the word of God when he, when he was baptized. He heard God saying to him and to everybody else, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. He heard again the voice of God speaking at transfiguration. This is my son. Listen to him. I love him. But this time, 
There was no reassuring word from heaven telling him not to worry. This time, there was no miraculous power. God had given Jesus the power to perform miracles. He raised the dead. He cured the sick. He fed the hungry. He walked on water. No miracles this time. He was beaten to a pulp. And he was left alone with his fear, with his anxiety. I don't mean to trivialize Jesus' passion. But we are at a moment in our lives when we are isolated, when we live in fear, when we live in anxiety because of the virus that is circulating among us. And it seems to me that some of us, if not most of us, are asking ourselves the same question that, he, that Jesus asked to God. Oh my God, oh my God, why have you abandoned we're asking ourselves, why? What is going on? What have we done to deserve this? Why is this happening to us? I don't know about you, but I find that I waste a lot of time going through news channels and going on the internet and looking for some kind of glimmer of hope, some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And there is none coming. As you know, I'm uh, originally from Italy, and my family, everyone that I'm biologically related to, lives in the epicenter of the epidemic. Now everyone is okay so far, but there is anxiety, there is fear, not just for myself, for my wife, but for my family, for my friends, for my church, for everyone. What is going on? Why is this happening to us? If we look at the Bible for answer to these questions, I'm afraid that we find a lot of bad answers. Um, the original answer from the Bible is that suffering and death are the result of sin. In the book of Genesis, we read that Adam and Eve committed a sin, they disobeyed God, and they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, and when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, they were told, you will suffer and you will die. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses tells the people, if you obey God's law, God will bless you, you will prosper, you will live a long and happy life, but if you disobey, God will curse you, you will be sick and you will die, you will suffer. And then the prophets seem to reiterate this ideology, if you will, this, this notion that suffering and death are the direct result of sin, when they explain all the bad things that happened to the people of Israel, all the wars, all the defeats, and the exile, as a punishment for uh, their sin. Fortunately, the Bible evolves on this topic. And eventually we get to the book of Job, when we see that Job suffered, but he was without sin. And at the end of the book of Job, God appeared to him and appeared to his friends and told his friends, you are wrong. Job did not do anything wrong. He did not suffer for his sin. Suffering is not the outcome of sin. Then Jesus continued along these lines, and in his gospel, he showed us a different view of the Father. The Father is not a vengeful and punishing judge. The, fa the Father is Daddy. The Father is love. Jesus used parables, like the parable of the prodigal son, and show God to be the father of the prodigal son, always ready to forgive, always ready to welcome God. Not someone who's there to punish, not someone who's there to take revenge on the unfaithfulness of the son. Jesus described God as the good shepherd who goes out to look for the lost sheep and carries, her, carries it back on his shoulders. Not someone that punishes the sheep because 
it ran away. But someone who is there to carry us back. It's a totally different picture of God. A couple of weeks ago, we read the gospel of a miracle that Jesus did to a man that was born blind. And the first thing that the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned for this man to be born blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus rejected that idea outright and said, nobody sinned. It's a disease for God's sake. And the fact that he is sick gives me the opportunity to help him, to show God's mercy. And it the blind man. So suffering and death are not the punishment of sin, regardless of what the early books of the Bible would say. Suffering and death are part of human nature. This is the way God created us. God created us with an immortal soul, but he created us with a mortal body. So we grow old, we get weak, and we die. I don't like that any more than you do, but that's the way it goes. That's the way nature goes. Think about this for a moment. Every living thing, be it vegetation or animals or human beings, will eventually grow old, get weak, and die. That's the way creation works. So let's don't try to explain the suffering and the death uh, that, that, that we are witnessing now as being a punishment from God. It is not. So why do we suffer and die? There is no good answer to this. There are a lot of bad answers, but there is no good answer to it except for the fact that this is the way creation works. However, there are some lessons that we can learn from Jesus' suffering on the cross and from what we are going through. The first one, as I said, is that suffering and death is not the punishment for sin. Think about this. Jesus was without sin, and yet he suffered and died. So, take that out. That's not part of the way reality is. Some of the suffering that we, um, uh, that, that, that we are inflicting upon ourselves is the result of the bad choices that we make. Unfortunately, we human beings tend to make bad choices, and the bad choices influence the environment that we live in. The bad choices influence the fact that we put the economy ahead of people, the fact that um, some people trying to go ahead by climbing all over everybody else. Those choices then result in the fact that when a situation like the epidemic occurs, we're not able to react. We put economic concerns ahead of taking care of people and the poor suffer. But this is not the result of the fact that God is unsympathetic. We just read the book, the, uh, uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. And in the epistle to the Hebrews, the writer specifically spells out the fact that Jesus is sympathetic. He is being there. So when we carry our cross, Jesus is there with us, carrying the cross and walking uh, on, along with us as we suffer and as we die. Um, but I, I want to point out one more thing, and it is the fact that Jesus' last words were not simply, oh my God, oh my God, why have you abandoned me? At the end, he found the strength to, the, to, to do a supreme act of faith. And he, and he said, into, my, into your hands I commend my spirit. It was like trusting God to the very end. Even though he had anxiety, even though he had fear, he trusted God to the very end. And that should be our cry too. Into your hands I commend my spirit. That's an act of faith. But faith must be translated into action. Faith is not just an intellectual commitment. 
If we have faith in Jesus, then we have to follow Jesus. What Jesus did when he found the blind man was not simply to state that uh, blindness is a disease, but he took action. He cured the blind man. We are now Jesus' hands and feet. We have to take action. We have to get over this crisis and learn from our experiences. We cannot forget the people that are suffering. Um, we have to take inspiration from the doctors and the nurses that take care of everyone, uh, even at the risk of their own life. We also have to learn that we can, the poor are not a burden. We cannot live without the so-called poor. Think about this for a moment. We all need food. We all have to go to the supermarket. The people who are there to stack the shelves, the people who are there to, uh, the cashiers who are there to check us out, are probably working on the minimum wage. We couldn't live without them. We're all in the same boat. We have to learn to take care of each other. The words of Jesus is that we only have two commandments, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We have to learn to take care of each other. We have to learn from these moments of crisis that our life must change. We cannot continue being divided. We cannot continue bickering with each other over economics or over politics or stuff like that, we have to change. Society has to learn. We have to take care of each other. God bless you.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Dabney, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese and of this parish, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith Increase it in love and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all the nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them. For Donald, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help, they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifferent, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth 
and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there might be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. 